Hey everybody, it's Ken Davenport. I am back. Welcome to another episode of the Producers Perspective Live. I'm in my office tonight, the award-winning playwright of The Inheritance and much, much more. Uh, he just made me laugh backstage, so you're gonna love this episode. Matthew Lopez up next. Let's get to it, Mary. Hit that theme song. Hey everybody, it's Ken Davenport. I, it's true, I am in my office. This is a brand new setup, which means something is going to go wrong technically. So just be prepared for that. It's going to happen and it's all gonna be Mary's fault. So just let's get ready for it. I'm here, I'm in an office, I've started coming. It's after Labor Day. I had to do something and sort of start the routine. I urge all of you to try to get back to some kind of routine uh, in your life. It helps. It feels a little bit better. It feels like, okay, we're getting through this and we're going to get through this. Uh, although I did do this. Literally, while the theme song was playing, while the theme song was playing, I haven't been outside, by the way, about three hours. While the theme song was playing, I reached down and I, I, I put some hand sanitizer on. I've, I've washed my hands like three times, but I was like, oh, I'm going on for a live stream right now. I better, I better sanitize. Did you find yourself over sanitizing? I do. I'll probably do it about three or four times during this episode. Uh, fantastic episode coming up with Matthew Lopez. I've been trying to sit down with this uh, amazing writer for a long time. Actually, we were going to do a podcast and then this thing called the pandemic hit. Uh, and now I'm getting this opportunity. I'm very, very excited because a very, he's a very, very serious playwright who made a crack. Yeah, he's, he's, he's like, like, not me. He made me laugh backstage. And this is why we've never met. This is one of those things. Uh, that I love about what we're doing is these moments where I get to sit down with someone and share some time with someone I've never met. And already he's not at all what I expected him to be, which is great. Uh, we're going to have a good time. Uh, welcome back to all of you watching. Alan Greenstein is in the house. Alan's in the house. Hello, Alan. Who else is here? Christina, Christina, Christina. So great. She named herself three times. Oh, yay. Uh, Love it. Just quote the Scottish tragedy, tragedy and get over it. You mean Macbeth? Yeah, Macbeth. I've got, I, I produced a Alan Cumming Macbeth. We got Macbeth all over this place. Uh, so welcome. Hello, Drew. Welcome back. Hope you've had a wonderful week. If you missed last week's episode, go back and check it out. A very, very inspirational episode with Sonia Taya, the choreographer. What a journey she has had starting in uh at rave clubs. I still really don't know what that means in Detroit. Uh, and then coming here to really take over Broadway from a choreographic perspective. Very inspiring discussion. Go back and check that out. All of our replays were on episode like 72 of this thing, Mary tells me. Episode 72. Uh, and we're going to keep on going. In fact, next week, Broadway leading man Will Swenson is going to join us. Les Mis, Hair, all those shows. He's going to be uh, with us next week. He did a very special reading for me. He actually did two readings for me in the last year. Maybe we'll, we'll tease you with what's to come there. Uh, we got some news, some big news hit Broadway. Oh, it'll be very interesting to see uh, what Matthew's thought is about this. Um, uh, we got some big, <laughs> some big news this week in that Ben Brantley, the chief, well, I guess he's the co-chief critic, they, they made that happen a couple years ago, of the New York Times, the drama critic, decided he was going to step down. Now, this really was fascinating to me because I did a podcast with Ben very early. And first of all, I never thought he'd be on the podcast. And he said, absolutely, I'll come on the podcast, which I I just loved his, his willingness to do that. I, I learned two things on that podcast, which I urge all to go listen. One, he just loves the theater as much as any one of us. Uh, and two, he says on the podcast, he's like never going to stop doing it. Never. So I found it very intriguing that he decided now that he was going to step down. But I have a feeling he did it for a very specific reason that I wrote about in a blog tribute to him. Because honestly, he does love the theater as much as we do. Uh, and he just his theater making craft was being a critic. 
Uh, and again, we'll get more into this when Matthew steps on the line. Uh, what else we got going on? We told you about the lineup. Our big theater maker summit is coming up. We're doing a big conference November 14th, 15th, and 16th. It's turning out to be a very special few days. So go check that. We have an incredible group of speakers, a very big group of speakers, and a very small graphic of those speakers, Mary, a very small, teeny tiny graphic, as my daughter would say. But we don't need teeny tiny graphics because we have a very, very big star of a writer on the show tonight. So let's just bring him on. He is the author of The Inheritance, The Whipping Man, The Legend of George McBride. He's won just about every playwriting award there is. Please welcome to the live stream, Matthew Lopez. Welcome, Matthew. Hey, how are you? I'm, you know, I'm doing as well as one can. How are you? <laughs> I'm fine. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me on. It's a real, it's a real treat to have you here. It's a real treat. It's a real pleasure. I'm glad we're finally getting to do this. Yes, thank you. So I, I have many, many questions for you. What? Well, then we'll start at the one that was just I came up with just a few moments ago. What do you think about Ben Brantley stepping down? Uh, here, here's what I'll say. Uh, I think that uh, 24 years is uh, long enough for anybody to be doing anything in this business. Um, and, uh, I wish him well, and I am looking forward to, to discovering who will be the next person, uh, in that job. What a very politically correct thing <laughs> <laughs> to say. Uh, what, what is that's all you're going to get out of me. <laughs> I, I, yeah, I, don't, I don't remember the reviews he's done of your previous stuff. Has he? Do you have a... No, I mean, I've almost been... Uh, I was almost exclusively reviewed by Isherwood at the Times um, over the years. Uh, uh, so my interaction with Brandley was almost exclusively as a reader uh, and as a theater goer. Uh, wow. uh, so, um, but, you know, the funny thing is, is that when you're a theater artist... You uh, you go see these things anyway, so yeah, when the reviews are are a little beside the point because you've got the tickets anyway, or you're gonna you're gonna go see it anyway, and so um, you know I, it's hard to talk about in some ways because I, I you rarely ever make your decisions on what you're gonna see based on what the critics say, um, uh, uh, and and usually what the critics say just it, it just means it's the type of uh, phone call or text you have to make to your friend the next morning. Uh, <laughs> uh, congratulations. Uh, yes, I told you it was going to be a hit. Or, um, yeah. you know what, they don't know what they're talking yeah. about. Or my, my favorite is, what, review? I didn't re I didn't see anything. I, I, I don't know what they're talking about. Well, uh, I, mean, no one I, I don't know, yeah. <laughs> uh, well, listen, let's let's start at the beginning of your, of your story. So why playwriting? Why, why did you choose this? this art form and this craft to go after? What about it uh, attracted well, you to it? You know, my very first uh, exposure to theater was when I was five years old. I, when my parents took me, my family's from New York, I was raised in Florida. My parents took me uh, when I was about five uh, on a trip to visit family in New York. And this, on the same week, I'm about to age myself a bit, but uh, the same week they took me to see uh, Sandy Duncan in Peter Pan. Um, the very, not only the first Broadway show I ever saw, it was the very first um, piece of theater I ever saw. I was five, and I'd never seen anything. And, and that, of course, was Peter Pan, and it was this the Jerome Robbins production, and, and it was just, it was literally magic, and it, it hooked me. And then a few days later, they took me to see my Aunt Priscilla in Day in Hollywood Night the Ukraine. And um, I think that one-two punch of, um, of being taught that theater is magic with the first show and then being taught that actually you can do it because right. you're, you have exposure to it in your family. Like it, it, it actually, the very, what's amazing is that that first production uh, created the, the magic and the mystique of theater for me. And then a few days later, going backstage to visit Priscilla before the play and then after the show, uh, it, it, it completely tore down the mystique for me and showed me everything behind the scenes. And it, it, it's, it's absolutely, uh, without question, that though that week in New York absolutely set the course for my life, and um, I thought for the longest time I thought I was going to be an actor. And I, um, you know, I did like community theater in my hometown, and I went to college to study acting. And then I got to New York, and I realized that very quickly. Thank God, I realized it very quickly that the thing 
that one must do in order to have a viable acting career. The, the, the inordinate amount of patience and, and, and uh, the thick skin that's required and the tirelessness, I just, I just didn't possess. And, and actually, I just didn't want it badly enough. And I think if there's anything that you, you could ever tell a young actor coming up in this business is if you've got to want it more than anything in the world, because if you don't, it's just not going to be worth it, you know? And um, writing was always something I did in secret. Writing was always something I did sort of on the side. It was like, a, I think it was like um, an outlet, but never really, I thought, I didn't think at the time it was something that I actually could do. I think I had this idea in my head that writing was this sort of exalted thing that you have to be sort of one of the anointed in order to, um, to, to take part in and, and I wasn't one of the anointed. And so therefore I just sort of kept it a secret. And uh, I've since learned that that's not true. And, and um, uh, it is true. I, I mean, it just might be true. I know you I mean, people say this, I'm sure. <laughs> uh, it just, I just, the thing that was missing from my passion for acting began to be there so fully in my writing, I, there was nothing else I wanted to do. There was nothing else that I cared about and I needed to do it. And I needed to share my my work with people and my, my thoughts and my feelings. And so it, it really was this, just this very graceful transition from actor to writer. And I never looked back. Um, as a matter of fact, I um, got a phone call from my acting, I had an acting agent at the time and, and he was letting me go as a client. He was dropping me as a client and uh, a few hours later, I got a phone call from a literary manager at Luna Stage, which is where I had my very first production. Wow. And she was like, I, we want to do a reading of, of a play of yours. And I know it was on the same day, hours apart. And I, it's just, you know, I mean, you don't need a better sign than that. And so really never looked back from there. So how did you, you said you were doing it in secret. So when did you go public with this information? Like, were you really hot? Like, were you nervous that you it just- wasn't, you No, know, I was afraid. I think I was afraid of being told I wasn't good at it because, you know, I had this sort of suspicion even at the beginning of, uh, of my writing uh, where where I kind of knew I didn't have it in me to, to, to be an actor for the long haul. And I think if I had been told that I was not good at writing, I would have just been crushed because I didn't, I couldn't conceive of what was, what, what else I could do. And so I think I kept it a secret for a while because I just didn't want to let go of the hope that I could actually um, make a go of it. And, um, and I started, you know, I started to do it. Uh, I started to share my work in college. I shared it with professors. I shared it with, um, with friends. I got to New York and I started to share my work uh, with my, I sent a play to my Priscilla to read. Um, I just needed a lot of, I need a lot of validation at first. And actually the person who gave me the, the most validation actually was the most perfect person. I, I had, um, so I had, um, I knew I didn't want to be an actor and I knew I wanted to be a writer. I didn't know how to do it. I, I got a copy of the theatrical index, you know, like, um, uh, I don't know if they still do the theatrical index anymore, but in the back, they used to have all the names and phone numbers and addresses of people who worked in theater. And I did like a big mail merge and I sent letters to so many different people and saying, this is me, this is what I'm doing. I, you know, if you want to meet with me, if you got something for me to do, I would love to meet with you. And I sent out maybe 120 letters and I got one response back and it was from Hal Prince. And uh, yeah, and Hal Prince invited me to his office and I went to his office, uh, which was that in and of itself was an amazing experience. Uh, and I sat down with him and he asked me what I wanted to do. And I told him, I, I, I want to be a writer. Should I go to graduate school? No, it's a waste of time, waste of money. Just start writing. And uh, he gave me the number of three writers who he knew who said, you know, reach out to them, tell them I sent you. And if they need an assistant on anything, um, you know, maybe they, maybe they can hire you for something. And so I called, I reached out to Alfred Urey, John Weidman and Terrence McNallan. Tax all of them, all three of them. Yeah, and 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 Yuri and Weidman didn't have anything coming up that they had anything for me to work on. But Terrence was doing a workshop of uh, a man of no importance, uh, his musical with Lynn and Stephen, uh, and he said, "Why don't you come and you can be my assistant?" Which you know doesn't didn't really mean anything, but just sort of 
hang out and watch what we do. And so I did for, I think about two weeks, I just watched them and, and Joe, uh, Joe was the director of that as well as the, um, the production that they eventually did. And I just watched them put a musical together for two weeks and it was an incredible, um, it was an incredible experience. And I, um, my pay my, uh, for that was at the end of this, he would read one of my plays. And um, so I remember bringing it to his apartment uh, on Fifth Avenue and um, uh, he didn't want an email. He didn't want to just like print it, bring it to me. And then I waited uh, for a few weeks and I got a voicemail from him uh, in which it, it, it's funny. Terrence didn't actually wait to talk to me. He just left this like five minute long voicemail, which he, you know, praise the work, critique the work, um, question things. I think you should do this. I think maybe you should think about that. I have a question about this. This is really good. This is really thing. You know, blah, and on and on and on. And then at the end of it, because we'd had a conversation and I told him I wasn't sure if I was a writer or not. And at the end of the conversation, Terrence said to me, uh, but if you're, if you're wondering whether you're a writer, you, you, you are a writer and you should keep writing. Um, and, um, and that was the thing that, um, I swear to God, if Terrence, I don't think Terrence would have done this, but if Terrence had said to me, you should go to dental school, um, I probably would have gone to dental school. Uh, thankfully, he didn't do that, and he encouraged me, and, and that began a, a very close uh, friendship with him, and um, uh, it was the encouragement that I needed, and that was honestly, like I said, I just needed just the little, the small bit of encouragement and very well-placed encouragement. And, um, and that was, I think it's funny looking back. It's like, well, you know, if Terrence McNally tells me I'm a writer, I'll definitely do it. And, and all these other people are like, what am I, chopped liver? And, but as soon as Terrence saw, saw me as a writer, that's all I needed. Um, no. Yeah, you know, look, I that Hal Prince story is very familiar to me because I have the same exact story. I mean, he was really? amazing. Oh yeah, I literally can show you right now. I have to get off my headphones for one second. This on my wall is a letter that he wrote to me oh after God. I went to see him in his office because I wrote him a letter and said, "Yeah, see, look, everybody, that's beautiful." Um, and basically he said kind of the same thing. He said to me, you, I pitched him like a thousand different shows because I said I wanted to be a creative producer. And just like you, Terrence, you, he said, your ideas are on the mark. And I was <laughs> like, I, I hang it up here because I'm like, okay, so I'll do it. I'll do whatever you say. Yeah. Uh, and it's amazing how we, we all need just that little bit. We all go through, even today, the you know, we all have imposter syndrome to some extent. I mean, sure. I want, listen, not to, to put you on the spot, but you've been so lauded as written one of the greatest plays of the century, century, look, and you can see, and, and you like shook your head when you were backstage and it made me laugh, um, or you said like over lauded playwright or something like this, even, even you, I have, with all of it, we have a bit of this imposter syndrome. So to hear something like that from terrorists, which is so well deserved, I'm sure meant the Yeah, world. it is. You know, and it's actually it was a, it was a lesson to me in so many ways. And the, the I think the greatest lesson that Terrence left me was how to treat other writers, um, how to treat not just those who are uh, younger than you and newer in the in the business than you, uh, but how to treat your colleagues. Um, and um, Terrence really instilled in me this idea that um, if we do not um, if we do not move through our careers and if we do not operate in this business with with, with dignity and respect for others, then then we're just um, we're not contributing anything to it. And um, uh, it isn't just enough to put your play out there and, and then wait to get the, the reception. It, you, you must engage with the community in a healthy way. Um, and and you know anytime as a result of that i think anytime anyone's ever asked me to talk to students to whenever anybody reaches out to me i, I to the best of my ability I, I always make myself available because if it weren't for terrence and listen terrence mcnally was terrence mcnally at that point yeah, I mean, right he Jesus. had been terrence mcnally for a long time he didn't have to do, i mean how prince didn't have to do that too John Wyman and Alfred Urey didn't have to return my phone calls, but they did. And Terrence McNally did not have to invite me into that room. He didn't have to read my play. And he certainly didn't have to leave that voicemail for me, but he did. And that, um, 
that generosity, not just of time, but of, of spirit, um, I think more than anything else is one of the, 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 the earliest lessons I learned in this business. And it's the one I, I, I always remind myself of. So whenever I have these feelings of imposter syndrome, which are natural, or even if it isn't just imposter syndrome, it is just the certainty, okay, I might not be an imposter, but I'm gonna fail on this one. Um, you know, um, it is, it was really just that dignity that that Terrence taught me um, that that as long as you hold on to um, in your in yourself and your dealings with others, um, you will ride through. I mean, because Terrence had his his share of disappointments and failures as well in his career, and you know, and they were no less painful to him when they happened. But you know, Terrence was beloved in this business, even when even when he was being prickly. You know, everybody has stories about Terrence being prickly. Um, so I have Terrence stories about him. <laughs> um, I can tell some ragtime stories myself. He, 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 he carried himself with dignity and he, he respected others. And I think that is, that's the prime lesson I learned from him. I also love that Hal hadn't read your work. Right, but well, he, like, I mean, just, I was certain to drop my my aunt Priscilla's name. I mean, that was I was no dummy. I was like, <laughs> I really love her nephew. Um, uh, uh, I don't know if that helped, but you know, you got like, when you're 23 and just starting out, you, you use everything you got. There's a bunch of us out there in the world that Hal did that too. He, I think he just read, he he had a passion detector. He could just detect it in people yeah, that people were I just gonna they, they were gonna get really good at it if they weren't good at it at the moment. You know, what's funny is after my play. Legend of George McBride was off Broadway. I heard it from him again. And um, he he said, come, you know, it's been too long. Come to my office and let's let's have a check-in. And um, um, and I actually didn't end up going into his office, but we he was in Tokyo for a long time and, and we just had a really great phone call one day. Uh -huh. um, so it was also great because, you know, it wasn't just starting you off on the journey. It was, it was like having a little check-in with him was great. I love it. I love it. Well, rest in peace to both of those incredible mentors that you had. Uh, I want to shift gears to the inheritance because I have to like ask you when you had when you got this idea to do this piece. Did you know the magnitude of the piece before you sat down to start writing it? Did you were you like I'm going to dash off a ten minute play and then like no. oh shit? Like what, I definitely. I mean, what I think you I think I had. I mean, I think there are plenty of people who would have the chutzpah to do that i would i did not i did not know what this thing was when i started it really started with a very simple passion which was that i really wanted to um i i felt i fell in love with with howard's end from a very early age i was a teenager and um i had my mom take me to see the movie when it came out because i was just sort of movie crazy and i wanted to i wanted to just sort of experience what people were talking about with this movie and, and fell in love with the story. And, and I, and my mother was a teacher and she got me the book and, and I read the book and fell in love with the book. And then I fell in love with the enforcer and then discovering later that he enforcer was gay and closeted all his life. And uh, it was just, it just, it stirred it. It was funny. Cause I'm just like, I'm this Puerto Rican kid from, from Florida. And it's just sort of like, why Howard's end, why he enforced her? There's like nothing that connects on the surface, the two of us, and and really the answer, of course, is that it was only the surface that kept us apart, and um, our lives were very different. But the way that he and he talked about uh, human hearts, and and the way people love, and the way people fear, um, the way people grieve, um, the 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 seeming impossibility of, of mobility between between social classes. Um, it really resonated with me and I wanted to to do something with it. And and the idea really started very simply. It was just this idea of taking my favorite novel and 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 the uh, the word I queering it, you know, I just wanted to like take do something that he wasn't able to do in his lifetime because he lived his life in the closet. And um no, I didn't know that this thing was gonna be I listen, if I had, I never would have done it because it would have just been too daunting, and I didn't know it was going to be two parts when I started. I didn't know. I didn't know anything about it. All I had was, a, like you said, with Hal, this is passion. I, I, you know, I've written, I'd written several plays, but none that I had just this burning desire to write uh, mm -hmm. such as this. And and I was okay with it being something that only six people and my parents saw. You know, it was, it was, it was never meant to be anything other than something that I just needed to write for myself. And as I started to work on it, it just, the dimensions of it started to grow. Um, you know, I, I remember, um, 
I remember delaying it for a long time. I wasn't, I just wasn't ready to write it. I just, I, I just, I knew I would be ready when I was ready and I wasn't ready then. And, and then I had to go through some, some life stuff and I had to just sort of, um, I think I had to just sort of live a little longer and then I was ready. I just remember being in a place where I was suddenly knew I was ready to write it. And I, I sat down to write um, an outline. I started to outline it and I had been taking notes for quite a while and I was rereading the book. And um, I, then I was like ready to outline it. and I sat down and in one afternoon I outlined what I thought was the first act. And it was like, you know, 13 single space pages, which is not unusual for an outline if you're being thorough. And I sent it to a friend of mine and I said, here's the first act of the play. Now this outline, uh, the first act of the play brings you up to the exact point at which part one ends. But right at that point, I just thought it was like the first act of the play. And uh, I said it to my friend and he was like, you're delusional. This is a three hour first act. <laughs> uh, there's no, like you, you're, you're writing a big play. And I'm like, yeah, I mean, I know it's a lot of characters. And he goes, and he goes, this is, and he just started breaking it down for me. It's like, this section right here is going to take you half an hour. This section, and, he, and I'm like, he's like, maybe you're writing a two part play. And I, I went to Elizabeth Williamson, who at the time was the associate artistic director at Hartford, who I was writing the, I was writing this as commission for Hartford. And I, I sent her the outline and I was like, do you think this is more than uh, an hour and 10 minutes? And she's like, this is way more than an hour and 10 minutes. And, um, and that's really, and you know what, when, whenever I first got sort of permission uh, to think in a much broader way with this thing, that's when really like the imagination started to pop. And I just, um, I, I really, um, I knew then that I could do things that you couldn't do in, in a two hour play, two half hour, even a three hour long play. Uh, I could investigate things that you you normally just not, never have time to do. And suddenly the, um, the breadth of it allowed me to actually, um, uh, dive deeper into it. And then it became this wonderful challenge of just like really getting to to write a lot. And um, I think, but it was really, it, it, it was self-revelatory. It, it, as I was writing it, it showed me what it was um, mm -hmm. and what it could be and, and how it expanded over time. Um, but no, I, I, and again, as I was writing it, I was like, this is crazy. This is insane. Again, I was like, okay, maybe not into 10 plus my parents. And that's, <laughs> it. Um, so no, I mean, the way people responded to it, once I started sharing part one with people was, was just, it was unbelievable. I could not, I literally could not believe it. And obviously unbelievable success on that side of the pond. You come over here, the review, everything. And you, unfortunately, when I always ask my my guests this question, like, where were you when the virus hit the fan? Oh, yeah, um, and you were in the last few days of performances, right? Yeah, we we. I mean, we were at the beginning of our final week, and um, I wasn't meant to be there that day on that Wednesday because I had just been there the whole weekend before because. Saturday before Hillary Clinton was at the show, and then the next day Pete Buttigieg and Chastin were at the show. Uh, so I was at the show a lot the weekend before, and I knew we were, you know, I'd be at the show a lot the, 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 the next weekend. So I figured I'd take a couple of days off, and, and um, but I had a friend in town, and I went and met her at the end of part one on that Wednesday, March 11th. And, um, you know, you could just feel something in the air that day. You could in the streets. Um, that was the that was the day the usher. Um, uh, I'm forgetting what show it was, but an usher had had tested positive, and you know, you, we that was when the a lot of people were talking about the cast of Moulin Rouge getting sick, and we had just you know, you just you started to hear these things, and I would hear about other friends who were. You could just feel it, and you could feel it in the air around town. And so when we, when I walked my friend back to the city, um, uh, excuse me, when I walked my friend back to the show for part two, I just had this feeling, and I, I just, I said, you know what, I'm going to stay and watch uh, mm -hmm. part two today. And and because it was the final week, and because they were actually filming the show that day, there were like seven cameras around the orchestra, and um, so they had a lot of seats blocked off. And I just sort of slipped in in the back, and I sat in the kind of little behind a, a camera guy. And um, and I think, you know, later I talked to them and the actors could kind of feel it too. And and I don't know if the audience could feel it. They were an amazing audience. I mean, the, 
the, the, the astonishing thing is, is that the audience was just, it was, you know, we've had some great audiences over the years and this was, I think in many ways, the greatest audience we'd ever had that night. And um, I left and I texted Tom Curtihy, our producer, and I said, I think I just saw the final performance of Inheritance. Oh. And he said, um, I hope you're wrong, but I'm glad you were there today. Mm -hmm. And um, I could just, and actually I talked to some of the guys after the show, uh, a few days later, and Andrew Burnap told me that he went back to his dressing room and he told Sam Levine and, and, and Kyle Soler, he says, I think we just did our last show. And, um, and uh, oh my man, I wasn't expecting to get um, uh, moved by that, but um, they, you could feel it. You could feel it. You could also, you could also feel, which was so beautiful in that theater, uh, just so much love. There was so much love and so much gratitude in the audience. And we've always played to loving, embracing uh, houses in, in all three productions. Um, and in that audience that night, which was just filled to capacity, I think because what was, what was sort of this fearful thing that was sort of encroaching, um, the audience really felt this great uh, gratitude for, um, for, you know, I mean, being told a story that without being about what we're going through right now ended up somewhat being about what we were going through right now. I mean, and um, nobody could have planned that. And um, leaving the theater that day, I just sort of felt that that was that. And you know what, honestly, because it ended in such a, a way, um, it, it was, um, I'm, I'm, I'm fine with that. You know, I'm really grateful that I was there and that we had that night. And then the next day, you know, I, I found out like, I found actually Stephen Daldry texted me at 10 in the morning telling me he, he's hearing things that maybe they're going to shut down the theaters. Tom confirmed that that was probably going to happen. And then I think around 2 or 2.30 that afternoon, it was official. And um, the actors were allowed back to the theater to collect their things. Unlike other shows, we knew we weren't coming back. And so the Schubert's um, let, let them come in and, and take their things. And, um, and they said goodbye. And, uh, and that was that. Well, I'm sure that's a play that when the theater comes back, will be done all over the world for a long, long time. You'll be able to slide into a seat at many, many productions all over the world, I'm sure. <laughs> I um, you, you talked about, like you started to outline it. Can you just talk about your writing process? Because if, first of all, you trained yourself as a writer. You just started writing. You didn't yeah. go to Jewish. You didn't do that thing, right? So I, I applied to one graduate school and I didn't get in. And I was like, I'm not doing this again. This is a waste of time and money. I'm just going to write. It was like, Hal Prince was right. I'm just going to. And it was like, it was, I was so like, I mean, I was very impetuous. It was just, you know. Or you crazy. were very right. That's well, the other yeah. thing. Right in me. I was just like, this is stupid. Why am I doing this? Let's just and, make that graduate school really regret it. What 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 school did you apply to that you didn't get into? NYU. I did not get into of NYU. Of course, of course. Uh, <laughs> of course. And so I just I decided to start writing instead. And um, um, you know, I'm grateful. Look, I think that I probably took the long route to all of it because of that. I had to sort of teach myself. I was very grateful that, you know, my very first play, uh, The Whipping Man, uh, was done a lot before I got to New York, a really strange, circuitous route to New York. I mean, it was pre it premiered at Luna Stage in Montclair. Uh, it was done at um, uh, Penumbra in, in St. Paul. Uh, it was then done uh, in, and then it was done in, in the Oak Globe in San Diego. And I, and I worked on it in those three productions. And I, um, and, and simultaneous with that at the Old Globe in San Diego was done Barrington stage. And I, that was weird because I was in San Diego doing work on the play there and Barrington stage. And I would email them my changes for the day. And they'd be worse. So they're like, scripts change it. Um, and so, um, yeah. And then only then did it come to, to New York. And so I really cut my teeth not in a, a, an, an academic environment, but I, I, I was thrown in the deep end with a paying audience from the very beginning. Right. And like, I had to learn, uh, it was all practicum, no theory. It was all just like day one of rehearsal, opening night, audience, you know, first preview, if you're lucky to have a preview at all in, in some of these theaters. Um, and so I learned how to write uh, for an audience because it's the only way I was, you know, it's the only, way I was taught. And um, 
and so yeah, yeah, I I I I did not have any bad habits beaten out of me other than by trial and error. I love that. It's just because I think one of the problems I see in a lot of the scripts that I read is you can tell the writer is writing for themselves. They're like, isn't this great? Isn't this great? This is like, but you you learn to write to get a response from an audience. Yeah, well, I mean, I went through that phase too. Isn't this great? Isn't this great? And then when you're in front of an audience, as often as I was at the beginning of my career, they are, they're very honest and they'll say, no, in fact, it isn't. And here's <laughs> why. And, you know, and, and you learn a lot from your first walkout. I mean, it feels like a dagger to the heart. And like, you know, and, um, and, and, you, you know, and I mean, look, I, one of my, uh, Stephen Daldry, one of his mantras is I love being wrong. Oh, I love being wrong. And, and um, I don't love it as much as Stephen does, but um, <laughs> I do understand it. And I have most decidedly learned from being wrong. Um, it, it is a great, it's a great teacher. Uh, failure is a great teacher. Um, and f you know what I would say is that I, because I was sort of cutting my teeth in front of a paying audience, the possibility for failure was very high. And so um, I couldn't afford to to make my to sort of write for myself. Um, I mean, obviously everything I wrote was very personal and came from from me. But no, I I, I had to quickly burn off that whole "gee, aren't I clever?" Uh, sort of writing that a lot of young writers go through, and and they should go through that because you know you are clever, uh, and 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 you should enjoy that. And and then, but then it's when the audience stops enjoying it, then you, you, <laughs> it behooves you to learn to stop doing to stop writing that way. And um, so yeah, I um. Uh, yeah, that was that was my uh, shot out of a cannon. Really, it was my career, but a very long sail through the air before you actually landed somewhere. Do you have a specific regimen or a process to your writing? Do you wake up at the same time every day? You write for eight hours. You just write when it's by the same location. Like I'm always curious. Yeah, you know, I that. used to for the longest time. I used to write at a, a, a writing space uh, in Brooklyn that I that I would I've been oh man I've been going there for ten years I think and then. You know, now that I've now that I'm not in the city anymore, um, I write at my home, and uh, I'm just in a little like a little bedroom in my in my basement. I mean, it's very it's like it seems bleaker than it is. Um, uh, and um, you know, life has changed now creatively for me because I live above the shop. You know, and uh, a lot of writers work from home, but I was never able to do that. And I was really terrified that I couldn't do it because usually when I try to work from home, I end up with the world's cleanest kitchen. You know, and uh, <laughs> So I had to really just sort of like, I mean, I did, I had to give myself a talking to. I was like, all right, Lopez, look, here's the deal. You want to create anything in the next year and a half? You better figure this out. And, um, you know, the funny thing is, is that I learned, and this is just, I can only speak for myself, but um, I actually used to write eight hours a day. And uh, now I've learned that I don't need to, um, that I actually can um, get probably just as much and perhaps even better work done uh, in less time. Um, look, I have the privilege of doing that because I, I you know, I'm, I'm, I, uh, I'm in a place in my career where I, 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 I can afford the time to do that. And, um, and that is a, a sort of a benefit. Um, but that said, one of the things I learned very early on about writing is that there, it is impressive. If you wait for the news, you're just, it, you're never going to write. And there, there's really is writer's block is just another word for fear. Um, and, um, you know, I just, you gotta, you gotta write and you just gotta get something down on paper and, and you gotta treat it like a job. And so when I, when I used to write at that writer space in Brooklyn, it was very easy to treat it like a job because I'd have a lunch, I'd walk to my little writer space, I'd, you know, do everything but clock in, you know, and, and, um, and I'd write and then I'd come home at the end of the day. Um, but you know, here it's like, um, still without getting to do that, I think it really is just a question of, of, um, it's all right if what you write is bad, if you, you know, it, you'll make it good. Um, you know, I wouldn't turn it in bad, but, uh, you know, when it, when it's so nascent and it's just sort of formless and, and it's just sort of, um, it hasn't, you know, really formed into what it's going to be. It just like I've learned to be gentle with myself, and I actually write first drafts very quickly. Like I want to just like blaze through a first draft. Mm -hmm. I wrote the first draft of Inheritance, part one in five weeks. I just like, <laughs> I like, I 
I had it all mapped out. I knew, I mean, I, I three act structure. I knew what every scene was about. I knew what every scene within a scene was about. I, it was the only time I ever worked that uh, sort of concrete sequentially. And I just mapped it out. And, and then I literally set from, I made a list, a to-do list. And I just started like, right, 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 right. Because I knew that um, the real work for me, the way I write the real work will happen as soon as it's done. When, it, when it's not done, but when it's all there and I can actually read it. I won't know what I've got until I read it. So I work fast. Um, I what asked the question about 20 minutes ago and I've ended up with this answer. I now I have like a zillion more. Uh, but so I look, cause I love that. It's just the spitting out this first draft, just get it. Cause then you can shape it. So what percentage of it do you think remained or changed after you got that first draft out? Like how different is that first draft from what was at the theater? It depends on the thing. The weird thing about inheritance is a lot of that first draft was spoken by the actors on March 11th um, or a version of it. Um, and that, of course, I, you know, if I were like my own teacher, I'd say, and that's what you get for properly preparing, and that's what you get for uh -huh. properly outlining, is that much of your first draft will remain, you know, five years after the fact. Um, I think that is a little more of a question of just knowing exactly what I wanted to write and writing exactly what I intend to write, which is a, a rare thing in, an, in a writer's career, and it was the first time it ever happened to me. Um, uh, you know, there are other plays of mine where that first draft you you, do, you you barely even recognize the play, you know, after it goes through the, the, the rewriting process. I think the biggest thing on inheritance really, um, especially on part one, uh, which sort of hews pretty closely to the plot of Howard's End, um, the biggest challenge on inheritance for me in the rewriting was um, divorcing the language of E.M. Forster, divorcing the play from the language of E.M. Forster and beginning to sort of assert uh, its own language and uh, uh, moving inexorably away from its source material. Um, you know, one of the things that, we, you know, when in talking about uh, inheritance, um, you know, one of the things that um, people don't often sort of mention or think about uh, is that it is an adaptation in many ways. And uh, I mean, it's a very free form adaptation. I mean, it's like inspired by rather than adapted by, but you know, if you, if you sat down and you look at the play and then you look at the book, a lot of the stuff that's in the play is, you know, informed by the book. And um, I use a lot of, uh, at the beginning, I relied on his structure and I relied my first draft too much on, on his way of writing. And um, while the basic structure, especially in part one, still held, uh, the rewriting process was just allowing Eric to speak in his own, Toby spoke in his own voice from the beginning. Like Toby was just like, I mean, didn't have to search too far for Toby. I mean, he lived inside of my head every day. <laughs> uh, but um, Eric, who I think also lives inside of my head every day of my life, Eric had to be cajoled out and Eric had to be sort of like, teased out and and I think probably a lot of the process of rewriting the play was was making sure that Eric was um, who he needed to be. How are you staying positive during all this craziness right now? How are you, you keeping your factory pumping out product? Like how are you staying up? Uh, I, the world is literally burning right now. Literally yeah. in California. Um, I I mean, look, it's hard. And it, like, you've, you've caught me on a nice night. Um, <laughs> uh, I think, and I think it's the thing that one of the things that um, it, I hope people find in, in the play is, um, look, a life, a full life is not a life lived without tragedy um, in, Right now, we are all living a, a sort of a simultaneous tragedy in our own different, in our own different way, in our own different key. Um, the, the pandemic, if that weren't enough, um, and then um, BIPOC communities are are experiencing um, uh, sort of uh, uh, BIPOC communities right now are are experiencing a, a, a kind of, well, I'm just gonna jump right over it and say, it, or a hope, 
I mean, that's really, I think that's the answer. I, you know, um, uh, if the death of George Floyd had just um, been forgotten a week afterward and we had uh, just sort of moved on with our lives, then I think it would be a lot more tempting to just sort of live in, in, in anger and to live in, 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 in hopelessness uh, as, as, a, as a society. Uh, but I found an enormous amount of hope in the majority of Americans' response to it. Um, I found a, a lot of hope in the way that so many Americans have responded to the pandemic. I found a, a, a lot of hope in, in the way, um, you know, people are responded to the, the nomination of Joe Biden and, and Kamala Harris. Um, I would be a delusional person who doesn't live on the planet Earth if I sat here and said, everything's great, this is awesome. Ah, no, 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 no. Um, this has been without question the most painful year of, of probably anyone's life. That said, I think what gets me up in the morning is I'm very hopeful. I'm very, very hopeful. I think that, um, I mean, you know, what, what? one of the poll, I, you know, we're not supposed to trust polls anymore. And I don't, when it comes to a, the, the electorate and who they're going to vote for, I don't trust polls. One of the polls that gives me hope is that a, a vast majority of, of Americans um, uh, look at uh, the Black Lives Matter protests of this summer into this fall. And, and they, they agree with the message. They share sympathy with the message. They, they, Ameri I think Americans who needed to hear the message have started to hear the message. And I think that in artistic community, in the artistic community, in the New York community, um, the process of getting people to hear the message within our own community is, is, is just starting. And, um, and as a nation, when it comes to the way we talk about this pandemic and the way we talk about healthcare being a right. I mean, like if anybody now has any doubt as to whether or not healthcare is a fundamental human right, this year has disabused them of that. Mm -hmm. um, and so, look, you know, I am the person who wrote The Inheritance and what The Inheritance is about is how do you um, move on from an unimaginable tragedy? How does a community rebuild? How does a nation rebuild? It does, it has to, it must, or else um, it won't. And um, I carry that hope with me. I, 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 I mean, I'm very hopeful. I know, I know it's been a little Pollyannish and I'm not at all ignorant of what stands in the way. But what I will say is there is no better time for hope than in times of despair. It's easy to have hope when things are great. You know, it's absolutely easy to have hope when things are great. To have hope in, through despair is the true definition of hope. And, um, and that's where I live right now. Well, it's a wonderful place to live. And there's no question in, uh, in my mind that you are the success that you are because of that hope that you've had, that gratitude that you talked about at the beginning and that positive spirit. I'm so thankful that you've been here with us tonight and sharing all these wonderful insights, uh, both into writing and into life. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thanks for spending so much time with us. Thank you for having me. Of course, of course. I look forward to doing it in person. Yes, one course. day. We shall. Yes, we shall. <laughs> Thanks so much for being here, Matthew. We'll see you soon. Take care. Bye. Matthew Lopez, everybody. Uh, for those of you who uh, don't know this on my Instagram, I put quotes on my board, uh, my morning whiteboard quote. Uh, they're usually inspirational. I now can do like the, the Matthew Lopez like sessions. Like we'll have like one for like four weeks. We've, there were so many unbelievable insights uh, from that conversation. So I thank him so much uh, for being with us tonight. Uh, we put up a hard copy, uh, a photo of the hard copy of the inheritance. Go grab that play if you haven't, didn't get a chance to see it, uh, but go read it. It is a brilliant, brilliant piece of work. What's up next week? Uh, don't forget Will Swenson next week. Will Swenson will be with us next week. We'll talk about what he's been doing during this pandemic. I'm also, don't forget about the Actors Fund. That's why we're here. We saw some stars. I, I, I was like just so intoxicated by every word that Matthew was saying, I all of a sudden someone threw us 50 stars. And I was like, oh, right. We're also raising money. Thank you for doing that. 
Uh, so do support the Access Fund if you can. This thing is going on a little bit longer than any one of us had ever expected, which means the Actors Fund is going to need you to help replenish their funds. Okay, so please do that. And now I'm going to go out with, like we always do, something to make you smile. Something to make you smile. Here's a video, uh, one that is near and dear to my heart because it's a song from Godspell, the first show I ever produced on Broadway. Uh, and it's, oh, it's Beautiful City, which they added to it. This one is by T3 and Nicholas Edwards. What makes it unique? T3 is a special uh, acapella group. And Nicholas is playing Jesus right now. He's in one of the few theatrical productions currently operating in the world at the Berkshire Theater Group. And guess what? I'm going to see it this Saturday. I cannot wait. I'm going to see how they're doing it socially distanced and all. And I'm just, I just can't wait to hear songs like this live. I hope it makes you smile and it reminds you that we will rebuild this beautiful city known as the theater. And I can't wait to see you all in the theater again soon and to see you next week right here on the live stream. Thanks so much, everybody. Stay tuned for this video. Out of the ruins and rubble. Out of the smoke, out of love, a night of struggle, can we see a ray of hope? One young pale thin ray, reaching for the day. City of angels, but we can build a city of man. Build a city of man. When your trust is all but shattered, when your faith is all but killed, you can give up better value. You can slowly start. City. Oh.